the lines against South Africa, you've got it on your plate. You're going to take the series win, and up comes Monet Stay in the last minute. I mean, is this hurting yet? Is this hurting? Chris, is, Chris is not even talking to him. And, and Monet Stay puts the penalty over, and you go, oh, if we only finished a bit stronger. There's a, there's a big disappointment in that. And the Bible is full of stories of great men who really finish well, but it's also got a lot of stories of incredible men in the Bible that don't finish yeah. well. It's scattered with both. And you can read the Bible sometimes with rose-tinted glasses where we think everybody ends well. Actually, if you read the whole of the scriptures, you actually encouragingly and discouragingly read stories of incredible men that Moses, who mm -hmm. God uses in an incredible way, never gets to drink, drink the milk and the honey in the promised land. Um, you had Gal uh, not Goliath, Gideon. Gideon, he does Gideon. Well. Yes, <laughs> Gideon. <laughs> Gideon starts off strong and then eventually loses everything at the end. David starts off this man of God, ends up hiding in a cave, adultery, yep. causing the, the death <coughs> of the, the, the wife's husband that he was sleeping with. So we have these stories in Scripture. So, and I've got a, a lovely text we're going to read together. So if we go to Nehemiah 15, in the context of Nehemiah, I don't know how many of you would know the story. So Israel, um, every time, well not every time, God used in the Old Testament, God would use the, the enemy of Israel to bring them back. You know, go send them to, to exile into the enemy's kind of hands of control. Chris, you looking for a Bible? Yeah, no, I'm just going to put it in my Six. 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 I'm sure I said six. Yeah. <laughs> So Israel are in exile, their city Jerusalem destroyed, Nehemiah, um, years of this, um, under the rulership of a, of a foreign king, goes to the king and says, hey, could you give me permission, but can you also give me the resources, give me a year off my duty to you, I'm going to go rebuild this wall. Mm -hmm. um, and God goes ahead of him and creates this opportunity for him to go back home to rebuild Jerusalem's wall. It's a beautiful, beautiful book on just God's <coughs> story of a city. Um, and in many ways, your story, yeah, I know that Ben and the Rondo Valley, there's a bit of, hey God, could we restore um, something of what you've done and, and going to do yet? So we get into Nehemiah 6, and it's interesting because in the middle of the chapter, the, the, the war is actually completed. So we're going to look today, I want to talk about four things that us as guys, as men, have to say no to in order that we could finish our race and our calling strong in God. So four things to say no to. Saying no to is not a very popular thing at the moment. We all, we all grow up in a culture where the culture around us always says yes, yes. to everything. Yes. Unfortunately, God's scripture, not unfortunately, <coughs> God's word also causes us to say, to resist and say no to. So we're going to read from verse 1. Yeah. I think what I'm going to do, just for the sake of today, just go through point by point and actually go to the passage, if that's okay. So the first thing we say no to is distractions. We say no to distractions. We, we say no to anything that would distract us from what God has called us to do and give our lives to. So let's read from verse 1. When, when word came to Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of the enemies, so these are the three enemies, um, Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem, were the, the guys that if you read the whole book are the guys cajoling, teasing, plotting to stop Nehemiah from completing his work. For us in our world today it would be the devil as an enemy, our flesh, the world working against you and our following and, and running our race for Christ. <coughs> our enemies and I had to rebuild the wall and not a, and not a gap was left in it. Though up to at this time, I had not set in the doors and the gates. So what they've done is they've rebuilt the wall, finished the wall, but then I still have to set in the doors and the, and the gates to secure the, the, the wall in the city. Sambalat and Geshem sent, sent me this message. Come, let us get together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent a messenger back to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. answer that's right. What? What a man. Like, come on. This is like some, this is some proper steel in his back here. What's happening? Enemies <coughs> are, are hanging around. Literally, the, if you read the commentators, they are feasting and celebrating that they are in control, that they've got resources, that they're wealthy. They're busy having a... Uh, a, a party celebrating the wealth and they're saying, hey, Nehemiah, the wall is finished. Come hang with us, come drink, come, come just enjoy and celebrate our, <coughs> our, our status and who we are. Oh no, it was 45 kilometers away from, from Jerusalem. It wasn't close. It was, in those days, they didn't get on a train or a plane to get there. 
They heard them, camel and donkey had to walk. So the opponents distracted, come down with us while we drink and, and celebrate our governorship and our, our thing. And Nehemiah knew that he was still not finished with the war. It was so close, wasn't it? It's that 78th minute, like, if we can win this line out or this scrum, it's our game. And we don't. <laughs> Why should this work? And I love his answer there. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. How do you view what God has called you to? Whether it's coaching rugby, whether it's driving a train, whether it is leading a church, whether it is leading your family, whatever that is that God has placed you to do, how, do you see that as a great work? You're going, hey, nothing's going to take my eye off the ball here. It's a proper cricketer, hey, Robbie. Don't take your eye off the ball. Just keep your eye on the ball. Nehemiah is literally keeping his eye on the ball. He's saying, hey, why would I go hang and celebrate with all the, the noblemen down the road and not finish this great job that I've got? And I love that. It challenges me. Hey, honor what God has called you to. Be careful of distractions. Keep your eye on the ball right to the last minute. <coughs> Four times they sent messages. <laughs> this one wasn't just the first, no, no, we'll keep this ball. No, no. Four times they come at, came at him. It's like that in our lives. We have an enemy. We have um, the devil. We have our own flesh that tempts us to do things. And what we see here is just the, the high view that Nehemiah has of what God has called him to. This is not just an ordinary thing. God has called me to this. There's a job for me to do. Whether it's with your family, whether it's with, in your career, your work, if it's in the church life, if it's the mission that God has called you to. There's, there's a high view here, but there's also the ability to say no and consistently say no to these distractions. Why would these small things distract me from this high thing that you're calling me to? How big is the thing that God has called you to? How important is that to you? Are you able to resist like Nehemiah? And I want to say, men, we have to continue. It's not going to come once. It's not going to come twice. It's going to keep coming. It's going to keep coming. Satan is persistent in how he's going to attempt, how he's going to cause us to be distracted. He's not going to just, it's not once we say no to, to a porn site or no, or no to, to, to the extra bottle of whiskey or whatever that looks like. It's going to come again. It's going to, it's going to harass us until we, and if we don't have a high view of what God has called us to, third, fourth, fifth time we say yes to it. And then we don't finish strong. We go back and go, what have we just done? We played hard for 78 minutes and we didn't finish the last lineup, or we didn't finish the last over the, in the match. I love Hebrews 12 as one. We didn't go there. Let us throw off every, everything that hinders and the sin that is so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. It's beautiful, isn't it? Let's throw every, it's going to, it's rid of every distraction in our lives that will cause us not to run the race that God has called you to. As we sit here, every one of us has been given by God. I believe every, for every one of us in this room, there is a unique race that only you can run in Christ, that He's given to you to run. And I'm our artist this morning, that we just, we get some steel on our backs, we're going we're gonna to finish well, we're going to finish this race that God has called us to. Andy Stanley, um, I don't know if you know him, but he's a really good gospel communicator. He talks about, um, it sounds bad, but it's true, um, all we must do, or we all in the room, need to, need to, we need to choose to cheat. I'll explain cheating now. It's simple. The problem is not the lack of discipline or our time management. It's simply the lack of time. We only have 24 hours in each day. We cannot do everything. We can't get to everything around us in life. We think we can give 100% of ourselves to our families, to our job, to our, our career, our sport, our hobbies, our leisure time. We think we can do that, but that all adds up to 4 500%. We've only got 24 hours to do all that in. It can't be done. Anytime we set a priority, we have said that something else is more important and something else is less important. You being here this morning, there are other things that you've decided are less important than sitting together and having breakfast with my mates at church. You've made that decision. You've made a, a values-based decision to be okay. This is important. That's not Whatever that could be, whatever you think it could be, you've decided this is more important than that. Anytime you say yes to something, we've also said no to something. Every time, every yes means a no. Every time we say yes to God, we say no to other things. And it's dangerous when we get to a place where we never say no to anything. We just say yes to everything. We can't say yes to everything. It's impossible. We have to cheat somewhere. I'm encouraging you, let's not cheat God. Let's keep saying yes to Him. Stephen Jack, a really good friend of mine, has been in ministry and God has just been just an incredibly faithful mate that just seems to, by God's grace, just to keep use, God using Him and using Him. And using him in ministry and he's been an incredible support to many church plants across south africa zimbabwe he's in the uk at the moment 
And we, we did this interview when he left South Africa just to catch up and we asked him, what is the one lesson you've learned in God? And he said, I just, just keep saying yes. And I mean, what do you mean? He says, no, every time God calls, I say yes. And then everything else is secondary to that. So what about your family? He said, no, my family, God calls and my family must adjust to what God has called us to. Don't be distracted by everything. There's a lot going on in our world. Secondly, Nehemiah teaches us, we say no, we say no to cowardice. We say no to cowardice. Verse 5. Then the fifth time. I love the way that the writer counts. Hey, there's a reason he's, he's counting. He's trying to send a message to us. Hey guys, it's not a once-off thing in your life. This is, get used to it. This is going to be your life as Christ follows. Then the fifth time, Sambalat sent, to, sent his aid to me with the same message and his hand. And in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true. That you and the Jews are plotting a revolt, and, there you are, that, and therefore you are building a wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become king. Now, this nation already has a king. And, even, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation. So is, they're saying, you, you are going to throw, overthrow the king, you're going to become the king, and you're even sending out prophets to send the message that you are king. There is a king in Judah, Nehemiah. Now this report will get back to the kings. So come, let us meet together. So now they're threatening him. Mm. We're going sp- to we're gonna sh- we're gonna spread some rumors about what you're actually doing mm. and who you are and what your plans really, really are. And we're going to spread it in a letter that's not sealed, that wherever this letter goes, everybody can read it. It's literally like, who do I pick on? I pick on Ben. People are sending a... Re- uh, ben wants to be mayor. Do you still do mayors here? I'm not really. That's, that's awesome. King of the Ronda. You want to be king? Okay? Ben actually wants to be king of the Ronda, and instead of just spreading it in a room and conversation, they put a big placard out here and they promote it, and everybody sees what's going on. So they expose a, 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 a horrible lie. I sent them this reply Nothing like that, what you are saying, is happening. You are just making it up in your heads. Literally, that's language we could use today. Yeah. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking. Their hand will be will get to get too weak for the work and it will be it will not be completed. All they want to do is weaken their hand. They're not saying stop. Let's just slow this work down. Can we just slow you down from what you're doing? But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. What a response Nehemiah teaches us. This this cowardice, this threat to us, our reputations at stake. What are they going to say about us? What are they going to think about us? The fifth time, this is not even now that the party's not even on the table anymore, now we're just going to take your reputation and we're going, to, we're going to put something on you that's not true. Nothing like that is going on. The boldness to say, hey, this is the truth of what I am and who I am. And nothing that you're saying is actually happening. And sticking to your guns, holding your ground to that. If we are to finish strong, we might be required to test, um, to test the amount of backbone that we have in our bones as Christians. You are not in today's age and, and culture and world Going to build a church, live a life that's worth Christ and what He calls you to without some backbone. And not being accused or fingered and, and pointed out, accused of being fascist or being far right or being ultra conservative because of your, some of your biblical views, possibly. Charles Lloyd says this the quota, the quota of wimpy Christian has been filled. There's enough. We don't need more wimpy Christians. We don't need more Christians that cower every time the world says shut up or your friends say, hey, don't say this. In South Africa, one of these. One of the things for us in our country at the moment, and many of you will know, we're still coming back out of an apartheid era. We're still, we're still, we're still building a one nation with black and white respect and honor, etc. And when in South Africa, the, the kind of the, the illustration that's very relevant to us is a bunch of white cars will stand around a, a bride. Well, it's not a barbecue. It's nothing like a barbecue. It's real meat and real wood and, and that kind of thing. But we'll we'll stand we'll stand around we'll stand around and write. Chris knows you'll, you'll, you'll never call a barbecue a bride ever. <laughs> so we'll stand around a bride with like, I could be standing on I could be standing with five of my Afrikaans mates eating meat together and one of the guys will say something about a black a black guy just them and have a go at a black guy and say something and Anna goes do I keep quiet or do I say something. Cowardice. Just do I shut up or do I say, hey, that's not cool. He's my mate. I've got friends. Don't talk like that. Mm-hmm. Or do we go, just it's one against six here, the bride. I don't want to spend the, I don't want to spoil the vibe and, and the mood at the bride. I don't want, 
So I used to get into a poli and don't talk politics with us. Nehemiah knew what he stood for. And no matter what people threw at him, he was to stand his ground. I love Charles Lloyd. The quota of wimpy Christian has been filled. Mm -hmm. There's no more room going forward for you or in my life for us to, to cower to culture, cower to, to, to attitudes, or even when people speak negatively about us and our faith. We will need some courage in the days to come. Nehemiah secondly said no to, to cowardice. Thirdly, he said no to compromise. Mm. No to compromise. One day, verse 10, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabah. Believe me, this was one of the hardest series we've ever preached <laughs> in all these words. I want to throw my Afrikaans accents in these things. Who, to, who, who was shut in, the, in, in at home. He said, let us meet in the house of God, inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors. This is the priest now, hey? saying this to him. Let's meet at the temple, we'll shut the doors, because some people are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. Pause there. So the priest is saying to him, hey, let's take refuge in the temple. And we'll get to why, why they were significant. And the priest is echoing the language of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Hey, they're coming to harm you. They're going, oh, they are going to take you out. Pause. But, every time you see but in the Bible, you know the direction of everything changes. It's, um, I, at English school, I was taught if you see, if, as soon as you read but, you can ignore everything that's just happened. <laughs> so uh, I can talk about, I think Wales is a great rugby nation, but you go, oh, you might as well not have said that. You might as well take it. It's just, I, yeah, I can't start that video down the line. But I said, should someone like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I won't compromise. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had been prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. So they paid off the priest to come with a message like that. We, I can spend Sundays and Sundays, but godly men that are hired by <laughs> in a false gospel in our day and age. He had been hired to intimidate me. And so... So that I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they, then they would give me a bad name and discredit me. So this temptation to compromise. Pay over priest. Hey, you're hiding it. Who in the Old Testament was the temple reserved for? The high priest? Only a high priest and only God. In the Holy of Holies. And this priest is saying, no, no, no. Why don't you hide in the temple? Why don't you... What's the word? Um... A sacred place? Why don't you go and defile the sacred place? They are coming for you. And he, might, he listens to this and he goes, No, why would I do that? Why would I hide? Why would I cover? Why would I compromise God? Something is special, it belongs to God. Some of the stuff in our lives, like our marriages are special. It belongs, it's a, it's a holy thing, it's a God thing. Why would I compromise and risk my marriage? Or why would I risk my, my, my testimony? My, who I am in Christ for another beer or another, another whiskey. If I, if I take the next whiskey, uh, there goes my testimony. There goes everything I fought for. If I take that backhand, or in South Africa, what do they call it? Bribe. 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 <laughs> a bribe is a bribe in every nation. That's amazing. If I take that bribe and I get the deal done and I can secure my children's future, it's worth it, isn't it? And if it's exposed, what happens to the Christ that you serve and the, the Christ that you honor with your life? Say no to compromise. The enemy hires a prophet of God and tells Nehemiah the same message. And he might realize, you're a priest, a prophet from God, and now you're speaking like my enemies. How is that even possible? Why don't you call me to faith and courage and to stand my ground? The advice given in this office is directly in opposition to, to the truth of God's word around the temple and what the temple is there for. In church leadership, when we at Bible College, they, they teach you quickly in your second or third year of Bible school, a theological school, they'll, they'll tell you there's three things that will always take you out in ministry. And I don't even, you don't have to guess what they are. Money, that you'll become driven by success in money. Power, mm. in control. And sex. There are no ladies here. They warn you about pantios, pennies, and, and power or privilege. So those are the three things that will cause you as a man in ministry to fall. And if you look at the history of church leadership, 
you could almost put every guy that doesn't finish the race well finding a way of compromising in one of these areas. That's for us too as men, just sitting around the table at breakfast going, hey God, what are the areas in my life that you, you're challenging me not to compromise in? What are the slippery slopes I'm busy walking and navigating where I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't assume I'm not going to slide. Don't assume that I'm not going to slip down. And lastly, my favorite one to say no to, prayerlessness. He said, I'm not going to be a man that doesn't pray. I'm going to be praying. Don't, or say no to prayerlessness. Verse 14, remember to buy and son, but my, my, so he's saying, remember my enemies, my God. He's literally speaking to God about his enemies, saying, these guys are tempting me, they are threatening me, they are, they are skeniving, they are, they are they're sending compromise my way. Because of what they have done, remember also the prophet Nodiah. He's even naming this false prophet, saying, and don't forget this guy who's also scheming against me. And how she and the rest of the prophet prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the war was complete on the 55th of Elul. The in 52 days, and this, verse 16 is where the magic happens. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work hadn't been, had been done with the help of God. They looked at Nehemiah and the war complete and they go, this was not a human being doing this, this was God doing this. When your friends look at you, do they see God's work in you or do they see your work in you? Mm. Is there something about how you're living your life where your friends go, wow, only God could do that. Only God could shape that guy. Only God could, could cause him to live a life like that. There's something about our lives, being able to say no to compromise, to, to be able to say no to distraction and to cowardice. To be, what is no to prayerlessness? Actually, it's no to self. It's saying, I'm not self-sufficient. I can't do this in my own strength. I need God's grace over my life. I need His hand and His power over me. So no to prayerlessness is, is almost a no to self-sufficiency. It's a no to pride. Okay? I can do this on my own. And it was nice. It says, but I prayed. And I strengthened my hands. But I prayed. They tempted me. They distracted me. They tested me. They threatened me. But I prayed. And I said, God, would you strengthen my hand? Brothers, we are not going to finish our races strong without two things. Without God strengthening your hand and without you saying no to a few significant things in your life. And I want to challenge us to do that. I'm going to finish with a story, if I may. We, we all like stories, eh? Anybody who heard the movie The Walk? Ever seen the movie The Walk in 2015? It's a motion picture and a true story about a high-wire artist, um, Felipe Petit. Ring a bell now? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You like me. I watch movies <coughs> five years later. Claire will, will watch a movie. Claire says, yeah, we've seen this. I'm like, no, we haven't. I, I switch off in movies. Are we all like that? Okay. Maybe this is the guy thing. Claire will remember the scene, what's going to happen. Anyway, in 1974, he performed his dream of walking between the, the World Trade Center towers. But in an early scene in the film, in, he's in a big tent, top, <coughs> like a big top um, circus in France, um, tying a rope on a beam across, and Felipe says, So Papa Rudy, his mentor, um, let me travel with, with his um, trope. Of course, I, I never did any performances. So he's a young guy, he's traveling with this older guy, 17 years old, and when, the, when there's an off time in the circus in the big top, he, he would on his own just try to walk over with the pole and just mess around in some ways, just to see if I could do this thing. In the next scene, Felipe is high up under the tent ceiling, balancing himself on a wire with a pole. Um, Papa Rudy enters the tent and looks up at Felipe, who was walking carefully but confidently across the thin wire. He hesitates as he's about to reach the platform. He's almost done. And then he takes an assertive forward step. But suddenly, Felipe and his wire starts shaking precariously. He falls to the side, grabbing onto the wire with both hands, barely avoiding falling to his death as the pole plummets to the bottom of the, on, onto the ground. As he hangs on the wire with both hands, the ground is the great distance below. He slowly works his way back to the pl platform, obviously shaking and trembling. He nearly killed and nearly died. Breathing heavily and making his way to the, to the ladder, he faces his, his mentor at the bottom, a Rudy. And he says this to him, Most wire walkers, they die when they arrive. 
They think that they have arrived, but they're not on the wire. But they're still on the wire. They haven't finished their walk. If you have three steps to do, if you take those steps arrogantly, if you think you are invincible, you're dead. This is his words to this young guy. He's in the beginning of his career. If you think you're done, you think you're finished, <coughs> you're not, you're dead. Finish it properly. I want to just say there's a, there's a humility in this text for us today. In this story about our faith, we can never take for granted that we've arrived in our faith. Don't ever think that I'm, I'm invincible. I'm never going to compromise. I'm never going to be distracted. I'm, never, I'm always going to have courage. I'm always going to be going to God. No, actually the opposite is true if we look at our lives. We will be tempted. We will find compromises. We'll, things will distract us from what God has. We will, we will do well in our walk and go, hey, I'm doing well. Actually, no, God is doing well through us and in us. Mm-hmm. Can I pray for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for it, yeah. Um, so I, I doubt that Honor knows this, but I, I love dates. I'm fascinated by dates. And the date that you just read at the end is in the Hebrew, it's the 25th day of the month of Elul. That's this weekend. That's the 2nd of October actually in the, in the Hebrew calendar and um, th- this was 4,465 years ago that exact date, that's the date that the war was finished and as Anu was saying it and I just felt the spirit prompt me around that date on October the 2nd tomorrow and here we are sitting at this men's breakfast I felt like God saying that he wants to close walls in certain ways in, in our lives, just like these guys it was the, it was the last day when they called this war and I think probably maybe, maybe two, maybe three um, areas, but the one that I think is some of us who are struggling with compromise, struggling with something where it feels like there's a gap in the wall, and you want to follow God, the path you want, you want to give it, but it just feels like something keeps coming through that wall, like something keeps on coming through the wall, and I feel like God is saying that if you take time out this weekend, it's not just this weekend, but if you'd, if you'd be serious around this moment, and around saying, God, I'm sick of this compromise, I don't want this compromise in my life, that God would actually come in and would close up that wall, so that's an area of sin, an area of compromise in our lives. And then I feel like the other one is that over this weekend God will come and just graciously close walls around our hurts and around our pains. And I think some of us, these things are, are, are loud voices in our head. Um, John and I are talking about our dads both being dairy farmers and that's been, I'm going to speak on it tomorrow about the father. And my dad was out of the home at 4am every morning and back at 9 o'clock in the evening for all my childhood, I have no childhood memories. That creates pains, that creates gaps in the wall, it creates holes in the wall. But the enemy then comes and in his, he exploits those mm-hmm. things. And so this is not an area of sin, this is an area of wound or an area of pain. I just feel like God's saying, if he wants to come on this first and the second of October, just as these oaks were finishing up their wall 4,465 years ago, and he in his grace wants to come and close up some of those hurts, some of those wounds in our hearts. Mm-hmm. Some of us have been there for, for me, it's been 40 years, mm-hmm. those wounds have been there. Yeah. So, all right, it's okay. cool. great work. Yeah. And it's interesting because Nehemiah, the wall was built, but there were doors to be placed. There were doors that would allow in and out of our lives, distractions, temptations. And, you know, there's like, once the doors and gates are, you can control what's going on. What I, what I go to, what I lie into my life. Mm-hmm. And very much before I said. Could I, maybe just, I think this is a real practical thing. Preach. It's like for us guys, we like, give us something to do. I'm giving you four things to say no to. Maybe while I preach or just before I preach, maybe think of, hey Lord, what is the one big no that I need to say no to? What is, what is just pick one, like today. Go, I want to say no to, to distraction. I just, my mind's everywhere, my heart's everywhere. I'm not, I'm not quite giving myself fully to what I know you for me to. Maybe it's compromise. Maybe there's something that's slipping and you're going, I know I'm playing games with the fire. I'm playing with fire. If I keep going in this direction, I know that Satan is not going to stop tempting me. It's just going to increase. It's not going to get better. That once or twice or becomes a habit, becomes eventually we worship that thing. Maybe there's confidence needed. Maybe there's a, cor- a courageous conversation that you need to have with someone. You're going, I've been skirting around, messing around. I don't want to stand and be courageous here. Maybe you like Felipe, the youngster that thinks I've got this all together. And you're going, God, I need to pray more. I need to ask your hand to strengthen me more and rely a little bit less on my own 
cockiness, if I can say that, or is that rude? I don't know. Um, but, but kind of, I've got this thing together. Why don't you just take a minute and maybe ask yourself, hey, Arna, what's the one big no that you want to say no to this morning? I'm going to pray for us. Could we do that? Yeah. Maybe bow our heads and just take our time on this one. And don't overthink this one. Like the first thing that it is, is probably the thing that God wants to do this morning. But I prayed, Lord, we want to be men by your grace and by your spirit that we find it easy to pray, easy to run towards you, ask you for help, Father God. Lord, we, there's something in us that recognize in my own strength, I cannot say no to distractions. Um, I'm thinking of the hymn that says, prone to wonder, Lord, my, my heart, prone to wonder, Lord, I see it. Lord, we know that it's not difficult for our hearts to wander off and away from you. Lord, we also know that it's not difficult for us to compromise or find ways to, to say yes to the things we know will hurt us, hurt our marriages, hurt, hurt you, Christ. Lord, we need your strength in our backs. We need steel in our backs, but that steel comes from you, Lord Jesus. Not in our own fighting it and, and doing it in our own strength, but leaning into you, asking you to help. Lord, won't you come today? Won't you strengthen us? Just as Nehemiah prayed, Lord, would you strengthen my hand? I pray for my brothers in this room that you would strengthen each one of us. For myself, Lord, in the area that I struggle with, would you strengthen me? Yeah. I can't do this on my own. I don't believe that I can finish this race without you, Jesus. Yeah. I cannot finish this race. I can't finish what you've called me to without your strength, without your grace, and, and your hand working with me, through me, in me. Would you continue to work in me and through me, Jesus? Yeah. Would you continue to strengthen my hand when I'm weak? Would you would you give me courage when I don't have courage? Mm. Would would you be able to strengthen me to say no when I'm tempted? Mm. Lord, would I, would I say no to distractions? Lord, would you make us men that are quick to call on to you, ask you to help and strengthen us? Mm. We don't want to be like Felipe that thinks we've got this thing. And fall to our death and lose everything that you've done mm. or that we've done for you, Father God. Yeah. So would you come and strengthen us? Would we mm. be men that, that not in our own strength, but in your strength, are able to say no? And say yes to you and to what you've called us to. Mm. Pray this for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I think today, I always as a church leader, I always think, so what's going to happen after this? I think what's really helpful with this kind of conversational kind of topic is if the, if you clear on what that one thing is find just one mate that we're here today even if he's not here and go go for a walk or go for a, watch football or rugby together and talk and men like talking while we're doing something we never sit, we're not like girls we don't like having a coffee date like we want to do something or go for a walk with a mate and start talking saying hey or maybe if you've got a friend yeah that you're really good mates with maybe in the next week go for that walk and say what was that one thing that you felt God challenged you on can I pray for you? And I don't think we, we realize how much strength and courage we get from our mates going, on and going, hey, Ben, I'm really struggling with this temptation at the moment. Would you pray with me? It's a beautiful thing for us as men to invite one another into walking together and strengthening it. Yeah. yeah. Listen, thanks for the privilege of sharing at your breakfast. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Yeah, Arno called us to courage there, and you know the thing that struck me as you were speaking at the end there was that Nehemiah he didn't build he didn't close the gaps in the wall on his own, right? He did it with his with his friends, um, and I guess I, I think I want to bring Arno's challenge back into the room instead of do it this week. Maybe right now we've got a few more minutes. Um, grab one person, two people, just share with them the one thing that you think God is calling you to say no to. You can be as vague or as specific as you feel comfortable with. But then say to them, you know, in a week, ask me about it. Because um, we want to act on the things that Arno has brought to us. Yes, so be courageous. Um, twos or threes, share that one thing. 
and then ask in a week. Ask me about it. Off we go. Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs>